Well, welcome back to the channel guys. Hi Max on Maxim Outdoors. If you're new to the channel, thanks for tuning in. I hope you're uh, going to enjoy what you're about to see. So, today, as, as the thumbnail suggests, today is all about hunting and camping in the uh, wonderful wintry Wales. It's about three degrees today. Um, and it's going to be more of an instructional video. Just my take on what I like to do and how I like to do it. So. I'm not going to teach anyone to suck eggs, but what you're about to see is just the way I do it. It's going to involve the setup and choosing where I camp and the tools that I like to use when um, when I'm doing this sort of thing. So yeah, let's just get into it and uh, set the tarp first. I think it's quite important firstly when you pick an area, it's just to get your base set up. So really the first thing I'll be looking for is just somewhere which is wide enough to put my tarp up and then just set up something that, you know, if the weather comes in, if it starts raining, I've got somewhere to put my gear, somewhere that's going to be comfortable, somewhere that I know I can start planning the rest of my trip. So I've chosen this area, basically, my tarp is three and a half metres wide, so really, from that tree to that tree, looks pretty ample or I've got a couple of options from this tree to that tree a bit of ground that I can um, clear if needs be but one of the main things I'm looking for is what's above me um, big big trees especially ash just love to drop their limbs unexpectedly we call these wood widow makers one of those lands on your head in the middle of the night either you're not going to know about it or you really do not want to know about it but there's nothing directly above me that worries me anyway. There's a couple of small sticks, but they're not really any bother to me. Um, we've got a silver birch here behind me. It's got so many uses in bushcraft. The, the bark itself is great for fire lighting. You can tap the tree itself for birch syrup come the spring. Like I said, it's midwinter at the moment, so we're not going to be attempting anything like that. But it's just an all around great versatile tree um, yeah so it's a pretty safe spot there's firewood all around me I can make a shelter if I want you might be able to hear a bit of road noise in the background there's a dual carriageway about half a mile away so I apologize for that but it's a permission that I've got to use and uh, I'm more than grateful for it so I've got with me an air rifle I normally use uh, pre-charged pneumatic air rifle but I was thinking about things and I thought that's not so much it's a great tool and I love it but really for a long-term thrival sort of you know thriving in, in the UK wilderness I think what would be much better suited to somebody like myself is what I've got today which is a spring powered air rifle and this is a bit of a see if it's rust on there, it's no good. This is a Virac HW77. It's an underlever. So it's a fixed barrel air rifle, which gives supreme accuracy. Um, obviously with a pre-charged air rifle, you've got to charge that gun, so you've got a limited amount of shots before you need to recharge it. So in a long-term situation. This thing is German, it's going to last a long, long time. It'll probably outdo me. It's fitted with a, a, a scope, which is a Hawk 3x9x50. Um, I think that's quite a bit of relevant, really. And I, I have a lot of people message me and ask what I would recommend for them, air rifle wise. My recommendation, really, would just be whatever you can afford. Whatever you can afford, and it's, it's going to bring you joy and satisfaction whether that be a thousand pound air rifle or an air rifle that I shot the other day which was a Stoga brand new 120 pound it blew my mind it would it would provide you food and more importantly it provide you fun and enjoyment so whatever you can afford whatever your budget just go out there and get the best that you can afford and enjoy it and don't really think too much into it because sometimes when you get really into something and things start costing more money you lose the satisfaction and the enjoyment of what you're doing so bear that in mind 
So I've decided not to go to that tree because the tree that I originally showed you is I've just found out it's dead. So I don't really want to be finding about that. <laughs> it's three o'clock in the morning. So we're going to go from this beech tree to the tree over here. It's a bit bigger than my tarp, but I'll have to do some clearing of the ground with some brambles that I don't really want to expose my tarp to. Other than that, it's a really nice spot. There's no widowmakers or quite nice flat ground so yeah a lovely little bushcraft axe here made by woods tools robin woods and i was just going to use it in a light manner just to get rid of some of the brambles here in the they're really thick and I just nib them off against one of the logs underneath Wellies are great, um, they're really useful when you're doing stuff like this, but as an overall bushcraft way, I think, you know, they will rub, but they're great if you're not walking massive distances, I would recommend a pair of um, good wellies. These are neoprene line made by Eigel, they're a brilliant welly, but maybe not affordable to some. I was lucky enough to find these on marketplace like all the stuff I buy is second hand or from charity shops or just I don't really I don't like spending money and if you can buy things cheap and second hand then bloody well do it so that was the area it's just nice and clean for me it's a nice workspace for me to to use and it's just gonna make my life easier when I'm trying to protect the tarp, which is my main source of shelter. I have in previous videos and in a lot of my camps built debris shelters, but today isn't gonna to be about one of those. I'll show you that in a future video, hopefully. This is my DD three and a half by three and a half meter multicam. This is made of a polyurethane. And it's a 3000 millimeter waterproof coating on this. So, I've actually got this set up in a, a sort of rapid setup. Um, so basically, this is just ready to go. You can see these two lengths of paracord here, and I always keep that ready to go like this. So on the one end, I've just got an overhand knot, and I'll show you why I use this. You could use a figure eight, but that's what I've got on there at the moment. So the first thing I like to do is just find quite a sturdy piece of wood on the floor. I had a good chat about this with one of my friends uh, using toggles and stuff. But it's not so, I want to make myself a good set of toggles. Probably make them out of you or something, something quite decorative but also versatile and useful. The first thing I like to do is get this knot, put it around a tree, like so sort of at head height, the top of your head. There's the knot here. I'm gonna get this part of the rope, of the paracord, make another little loop and push it through there. Like so. And I'm gonna get the piece of wood that I just got off the floor, put it through, and then push it up tight against the tree. Like so. So I know that is sturdy on there, and it's gonna that's hold my weight, let alone the weight of the, of the tarpaulin. Now I'm going to take the other length of the paracord and take it over to the other side of the tarpaulin hang to the, the far tree. I'll take you over there now and show you what we're going to do over there. So here we have the other end of the rope. I've got a series of what we call prussic knots and they're just loops. They're loops of cord you can YouTube this rather than me explain it to you now on how to tie a prussic knot. But they're super, they're super easy. I've just got a length of rope and I've tied an overhand knot with the both ends. And uh, YouTube prussic knots, they're amazing because you can pull on them and they won't move. But if you just slide them, they'll move. Again, really, you can pull on them, you can climb rope with them. I think that's where it derived from. We're going to forget about that today. 
what I'm going to show you is one of the easiest methods and I think the best method as well to tie in the other end of your, your ridge line up. Now I actually copied this from a channel called with a guy called Dave Canterbury. A lot of, if you don't know who Dave Canterbury is go and research the guy he's just one of the most knowledgeable bushcrafters on YouTube and just a super humble guy. Anyway so the first thing we're going to do is tie what's known as a slippery half hitch. The first thing you've got to do is take a loop of line like so, go up the line like this, just fold it over the top and pull this up through and that creates a slippery half hitch. That's it. Take a loop of line like so, fold it over and pull the line through. Again, a slippery half hitch, super versatile knot. Now, the next bit, the bit you've got around the tree, right, take another loop, like this, and put that loop through your slippery half hitch, like so. Okay, again, there's your slippery half hitch, go around the tree, take another loop and put that through your slippery half hitch. Now what you're left with is the tag end of this loop, right? And what you want to do is you want to take another loop and put it through there and tighten the whole thing down. So what this, what this does now is actually acting as like a ratchet system. I've got my ridge line, my top's hanging off this, I'll show it in a second. But you can really just use this to pull as much tension into that ridge line as you want. And the beauty of this knot is you can literally just get rid of it all. Gone, you're gone. Your stuff's packed up and you're gone. So I'll set that back up to you. So my tarpaulin is hanging suspended from this. Like I said, I've got a couple of series of crusset knots. And I'll come into it later. So as you can see, just pull that out. And I can just string the tarp out sort of have a have a guess to where it's going to be equal between the two trees it looks pretty good so on this side I've got a prussic knot and I'll show you what I, I do to the ends of the tarp so on this end as you can see the tarp is actually suspended by the, the ridge line through the loops we're going to take the end loop of the tarp and this prussic knot is going to go through the loop like so and we're going to get our little piece of wood and put it through the loop there we'll tighten down to that and as you can see the prussic knot is now stopping the tarp from going that way we're going to do the same to the other side and tension the tarp out So you can see there that tarp is now nice and taut. So the next thing to do obviously is peg out the corners of the tarp. And sort of just a, just adjust the tarp to how you wanna have it on each particular trip. It's completely up to you and that's the blessing of being out and doing it your way. This is just the way I do it. Do it your own way, whichever way you enjoy really. One of the biggest tips I can give you when pegging a tarp out, I'll just I'll just tie a quick overhand knot in here, just so you can see it in view. This is such a simple piece of advice that everybody should know, and most of you know, most of you will know. But I've seen a lot of channels, and I'm not going to mention any. I've seen a lot of people do it, but I I'm not going to mention any names because I. I'm not into that, it's not about me. It's the position of your peg going into the floor. 
you should always put it at almost 45 degrees away from the point that you're pegging in like so because you're actually pulling back against an anchor point if you do it vertically okay I've seen so many people push push their pegs in like this and security is just not there so always 45 degrees away from the point you're pegging and it'll give you a far greater resistance in wind and adverse weather so that's the tarp up we could now if it, if it was raining badly or snowing or windy we could get under there and it give us a basis to be just just more comfortable than in the open that's what I'm going to do now is just going to get my kit under there I'm going to have a look at my resources and just think to myself my next act so that's the tarp up as you can see and I'm just putting my kit underneath another thing you could do is get a stick tie it round and create yourself a door or a point of entry into the tarp to save your back trying to duck it down or using the, the ends it's really nice when you've got a fire here just tie this away have the fire and a fire wall behind it be careful not to to blim your tarp with the sparks but it's something I do quite often a good tip right now which would be gather some firewood gather some dry wood luckily right now pretty much everything is dry otherwise you want to be looking for dead standing wood stuff hanging in the trees that is normally snap dry start making yourself some kindling and get under the tarp where you know if the weather turns for the worst, you're going to have a source of dry tinder making your life a lot easier when it comes to making yourself a fire and being comfortable in your environment. So that would be one of the first things I do now is get myself some good firewood. So what I'm doing now is just peeling some of the outer bark off the silver birch. I previously said in one of my videos that silver birch isn't native to the UK, but I was wrong. So it's all about learning, there's one thing I didn't know and one thing I do know now. Don't go getting your knife and trying to peel off a live tree like this. If you find one dead lying down on the floor then yeah that's okay this stuff is just full of natural oils and it's super flammable and will quite easily take a spark off a, a ferrule cerium rod and striker and that's exactly what we plan to do i spent some time sorting through the firewood collection that i've got and separated them into individual piles of various thicknesses and it's one of the most important things in fire lighting is prep it's where people seem to to lose the fire so quickly is because they haven't taken the time to source through firewood and put those individual piles of various thicknesses in so when it comes to the fact they've got a flame they'll soon go out because they haven't got the tinder pile to put on top so you can see this is really fine stuff and I'll show you the, the tinder pile so coming from this side, we've got our fine tinders, and this is what this will be the first thing that we we put on when we've got a, a bigger pile of tinder ready to go. So that'll be the first. As you can see, it's made up of birch and light ash, but also bits of clematis and stuff that I found hanging up from last year's season. Then we're moving on to a, vi a variety of really thin 
timbers and um, then also a little bit thicker but very dry pieces of ash and a, a whole variety really of native trees there then obviously we've got thicker stuff and thicker stuff and eventually we'll be moving on to that sort of size tinder but we're ready to go we're going to put these back under the tarp now and uh, keep them for when we need them we've now got the security in our minds that we're ready to go when the time arises We've got a couple of other things to do now. I'm starting to get hungry. You know, in reality, I've got two weeks <laughs> to to find something to eat, but I haven't actually brought any food with me apart from rice, which is a good carbohydrate. I've also got a litre of water. Where I live in Wales, we have an abundance of water. It's quite a very wet climate that we live in. Right now is lovely. It's, it's like I said about three degrees which has got a, a floor of firewood around us and it's just a beautiful time of year to be out I'm going to grab my air rifle now the first thing I'm going to do before I go out looking for for quarry is to make sure that my my rifle is zeroed and what I mean by that is that it shoots on target so we're going to go to 25 yards we're going to put a little target up I'm going to take two or three shots probably and make sure that the group of my pellets is within a brain sized target. So. A super handy bit of kit if you're into your hunting is um is this it's called a laser range finder. Once you look through one end, press a button and it'll give you a reading of distance up to about three hundred yards. And uh, it'll give you a reading to the nearest half a yard. It's a brilliant piece of kit. You can pay a lot of money of these but I paid I think it was about £40 off Amazon and it does the job fine so again it's about your budget so what we're going to do is we're going to look, click it, check out 25 yards put a target up and make sure our, our air rifle is zeroed which is the most fair thing you can possibly do when hunting now one thing I'd like to talk about is the ammunition that you're using for your air rifle one thing I wouldn't skimp on is pellets. These are Air Arms Diablo Field. There's another one that I use called JSB Exacts, but these are about £20. Now if you compare that to a 2.2 bullet rifle, very cheap. But these are very clean pellets and they're, they're really well manufactured and every pellet is pretty much the same. So it doesn't you could buy the world's most expensive air rifle. Put cheap pallets to it, it's going to be rubbish. If you could buy a relatively cheap rifle, like the Stoga of my brother-in-law's that I used the other day, but he was using a, a similar pellet and at 25 yards, again, great groupings. And really, in a rifle like that, you don't want to be shooting past 35, 40 yards anyway, even though it might be capable. So, again, one thing you shouldn't really skimp on is pellets. If you have to, you have to, but really it's unfair. These are Diablo Fields. GSB exact, so they're two of my, two my favourite type of pellets. I'm going to use this rather large rock because it's going to be a, a solid backstop, making sure the pellets don't fly off into the distance. I'm going to walk backwards now, laser range find you at 25 yards. This is also going to show the pellets up really well. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, 
28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 28. So 29 yards. So 29 strides. I'm 5 foot 8. Which is perfect size actually. This is the way God made me and he knows what he's doing. Before Rob Hudson says anything. Um, 29 yards works out at 25 yards for me. So that's a great reference point. If you haven't got a range finder. Go and measure a distance. See how many relaxed strides it then takes you to cover that distance. You'll always know in your mind that your zero point is X amount of yards. So I've moved the camera back for the sake of the video, but I'm still at that fixed point, 25 yards. I'm gonna pop these pellets behind you. Some brake barrels. They've got safety features on them. Also, some fixed barrels. They've got anti bear traps. Obviously, that is against the load of the spring. So, even though when you cock it, it might stay there, do you really trust a piece of metal when you're putting your finger inside the breech? So I always keep that grip tightly when I insert in the pallet into the breech. Take your fingers away. This has got an automatic safety on the back. So we're ready to shoot. Pays when shooting a spring rifle not to grip the gun at all, really. Just enough to hold it. With a pre-charged, you could really grip that. But as this has been a recoiling rifle, you want the rifle to do the work and to be able to recoil without throwing the shot off. So we're just gonna take what I'd say is reference point shot. Went off with a nice crack, and now I've got a point to aim my next shot on, so I can see where my gun is shooting. I might have actually zeroed this gun at 30 yards, I can't remember, but I'll know if it's shooting within the next two shots. I'll know if it's shooting on target. Again, safety off. Slightly to the left, but that could have been me. <sighs> yeah. So, to the point, I'm going to go and put a target up and put you behind me. Got a little stone here, roughly the size of a squirt, squirrel's head. So I'm going to pop that on here, and uh, I'm going to go take a shot at it. There we go. I think you'll agree the gun smack on. So I'm glad that happened first time. Springers can be unpredictable sometimes, so yeah, let's go on with the hunt. I wouldn't go taking a whole tin of pellets if you're gonna go stalking. I mean in a hunting scenario, how many shots you're gonna take and how much food do you really need for a, the duration you're gonna be spending, so keep that in mind. I'll just take a small palm full of pellets and it's quite noisy carrying pellets in the tin anyway but so we're just going to leave that at base camp take our gun and we're going to start picking our way up these hedgerows just every now and again just stop in every few steps look around us keep these things out of your hat it's one of the primary sources of of seeing quarry 
or sorry, hearing quarry and spot net is your ears. So many times you can hear just a rustle in the trees, and you'll see a squirrel, or rabbits, quite, you know, they, they tend not to make any noise until the point that they're running away from you, so bear that in mind. Go slow, go steady. We just spotted a, a lovely healthy rabbit, but unfortunately, with the cover being so thin on the ground at this time of year, it saw me and it just hopped off into its, its cover over there, so even though I was walking slowly, it still heard me. It's just that type of view, it's unfortunate, but it is a game of millimetres. So we're going to carry on our stalk now and have a look what else is about. Hopefully another opportunity arises. area now after a bit of a walk around I made the decision to come to this area because I noticed that a lot of pigeons are following what we call flight lines which is their natural line of traveling throughout their activities during the day and they're, they're coming to take breaks in this, in this big oak tree behind me so I'm gonna perch myself by here for a bit um, I'm out of the way of the line of sun as well, so they're not really going to be able to see me here. So I'm just going to have half an hour just sat here, relaxing, and hopefully when I swoop into the tree and perch long enough for me to take a shot off. Where I, um, where I took the shot, I think the wind was blowing the, the, the branch and the pigeon um, sadly just moved as I pulled the trigger and I hit them in the wing. I'm not going to show you too much of that because it's quite graphic, but just pop him down there. That, that is, as is unfortunately a way of hunting sometimes, it is a game of millimetres and you're always going to run the risk of sadly maiming an animal, it's not something we ever want to happen but it's something that does happen quite often. Hopefully the wind isn't affecting the microphone too much but um, yeah. I've had to run over and dispatch the the pigeon but it was a bit of a nightmare getting in the bush but within 15-20 seconds that pigeon was lights out. So success on my behalf, something to think about next time. This does happen as an accident, but luckily it's dispatched and not feeling anything anymore. So we got dinner sorted. Let's go. I think we're going to take the gun and go and look for some edibles, some wild edible plants. This being winter, there's not a lot about. Um, but hopefully we can go and find something and see what happens. I'm walking around having a bit of a stalk if I'm seeing animals further afield sort of study their patterns if you can and just try and work out what they'll be doing throughout the day and I'll give you a better insight than what you're going to do later on when you're going to go and try and hunt them um, but as I'm as I'm having a stalk I'm also looking around me for, for wild edibles as well and I've noticed a few things 
like you'll potentially eat. Um, obviously one of the first ones is nettles, although they are quite small, the smaller leaves can be more succulent than the, an adult plant. The, the other thing, the other thing I found is, well, I'll show you now. So what we have here is the male seeds of the hazel tree and they're called catkins. Now I'm sure quite a few of you have already seen these but didn't know that they were actually edible. These are best roasted and they're quite a good in addition to rices and couscous and a, a, quite a good source of protein as well. So we're going to try and gather a few of these. There's only one problem is they are up there and I'm down here so it's going to be a bit of a struggle. I'm uh, going to put a camera down for this one because I don't want YouTube seeing me fall on my ass. So I spotted another wild edible here. These are called cleavers and uh, a lot of them, a lot of you will have known the plants probably when you were young these produce a little uh, ball that can get stuck to clothing quite easy and can be a bit of a nightmare to get off your clothes sometimes and we used to throw them at each other to annoy each other as kids so again uh, another wild edible but it's best used as ground up after being dried and used as a substitute for coffee so we're gonna we're gonna pass that one on today see the the still a lot of mistletoe around Obviously you don't want to be eating that. Mistletoe. So as beautiful as mistletoe can be, it is actually a um, parasitic plant that grows on a variety of trees, but it is bad for the tree itself. Right guys, so I could have spent a long time really just going for a walk reality I've got some rice in my bag that I intend to cook along with the pigeon. I'm gonna basically steam and poach the nettles. And regarding the catkins they're not one of the most tasty things to eat but the important factor behind it is that the important minerals and vitamins and anti-inflammatories that can actually get carried by the pollen itself in, in the cat in the catkins. I don't know if I mentioned In reality, if you were going to make a fire that was just going to be straight up for all night, you'd make it on a bigger scale than this, but I just want to make this fire for purely cooking this meal. Um, I've obviously started with the thicker stuff, crossed it, and then crossed that way with thinner stuff, and built it up to this where I put the fine kindling on top, and then the ash and the, the hot embers will fall down, create a fire that you don't really have to keep putting stuff on to build it up.
So you can see that that birch bark I collected earlier has just got super natural oils in it that's creating a really nice a really nice flame. Um, I always try and just keep a little bit back just a sprinkle on the top and try and get some of the flames to Bring it back when that's uh, going nicely. So I've come to a different part of the wood just to prep this bird. And I'm going to dig a hole on my right hand side here and I'm going to bury the carcass there so that um, it can rot down naturally and not even let a mess in the woodland because the feathers can go absolutely everywhere. But to start picking and plucking the, the feathers off the breast of the bird you'll immediately start to see the dark red meat underneath the skin be a bit gentle I do like sometimes to keep the skin intact so that um, if there's any fat on it it really renders down to a better flavour when um, you're cooking a bird which is nice again like I said other than the breast there's not a lot of meat on a pigeon so uh, I normally just breast them out. If in a survival situation I really was desperate for every bit of food then I'd consider plucking the whole bird but just for the purpose of this video we're just going to breast the, the pigeon out. As so you can see here the dark meat is underneath the skin there so just spend a bit more time plucking the feathers away because when you actually come to cutting the breast off the pigeon it'll stop the feathers going everywhere on, it, on the meat provide a bit of a easier job cleaning the meat then ready for the, the pot right guys I uh, I told a bit of a fib there I've gone the whole way I thought if I'm going to do a video demonstrating and you know acting that survival situation with a air rifle then I thought I might as well go the whole hog. So as you can see here, we're left with pretty much the whole bird stripped. I've plucked the feathers to the second joint on the wings, which I'll lop them off with a knife after just dislocating the joint. And coming down to the feet, I'll also knock them off. And I'm hiding the head, but I'll cut that off as well. And then I'll make an incision into the, the back end, the poop chute, get the two fingers inside and remove all the innards that way so we'll come back and take you back over to the fire when I've done that so we're back over at the fire and there we have one pigeon basically ready for the pot any tiny little feathers don't worry too much about them because they'll just burn off in the fire um, like I said we've took all the inners off one thing I will state when you do come to uh, gutting the animal as such have a look and pay attention to what's inside the crop where it's been eaten you'll see what sort of fruits and berries has been eaten it'll give you an idea for later on of what sort of feeding patterns the pigeons or the animals that you you're shooting will have and you can then plan tomorrow's hunt and such knowing where they're gonna go and where they're gonna be so it's a good tip there So now the fire's died down a bit, I put a bit more ammo on the top. You can see that I've got my Nagini water bottle there. I've normally got a, a wire handle to go inside it so you can pick it off the fire, but I took it out the other day, I forgot to put it back in. I've made a suitable little spit roast for the pigeon. And then you can see I've got my nettles and the catkins led on my gun case. I thought this would be just quite a nice little um, picture to, to record. So the, the hot water is for the rice but also to wash my hands. It's given me time now to go and sterilise my knife and just have a bit of a tidy up, feel a bit more comfortable about things. So hopefully now the flames will build back up on the fire. The pigeon's going to cut quite nicely. Um, you can actually eat 
pigeon breasts more like you would steak and personally I, I like all my food well cooked when I'm outside I just don't see uh, any necessity in taking risk so that's what I'm gonna do I actually prefer the taste of pigeon well cooked sliced up and uh, on salads it's beautiful it's a really really under underrated game bird and one of possibly my favorite game meats out there it's really beautiful out the day just want to sit, sort of sit back sometimes and soak it all up the water's starting to boil I've decided to to roast the catkins on the grill of my bush box stove um, so it's just right there you smell really floral but you've got to watch them because they don't take long and then they'll they'll just explode into flame um, yeah the pigeons looking pretty good and it's over a good solid heat here so that won't be taking much longer at all I put the nettles now in with the rice or so cook them with the rice I, I don't know about anybody else but I normally when cooking rice just use twice as much water to the amount of rice bring it to a boil then turn it down to a simmer and basically by the time the rice is cut there's no more water left and my thinking behind that as well is I don't want to be chucking the water away from the nettles because that's where a lot of the goodness is going to be I'm seriously starting to regret not bringing the, um, the handle for this <laughs> so why I even cooking the rice and wait for the pigeon to finish cooking I'm gonna make myself a hot drink in my titanium cup it cost me a pound from a charity shop like I said in a previous video if you haven't seen it I love I love charity shops I love buying things second hand I like reusing stuff um, yeah so I've got a coffee sachet in here but again in a situation pine leaf tea would be a uh, pine needle tea would be a great one again with its antioxidants other vitamins inside would be a great thing but saying I've got a uh, coffee sachet that's what I'm going to be having and I measured the rice out it should be all right. I measured the rice out in the cup lid so I know what um, double that's going to be which is about there and we'll just go and splash for a laugh because I splashed quite a bit on the floor then put that back into the fire just incinerate my hand now again it's just impossible um, yeah what to do should be alright That was hot. Just keep that by the fire. Keep it nice and warm. It'll be handy then to wash my mug and wash the, the cooking apparatus. I don't know what you would call that. It's a mug, isn't it? It's a cup with a lid. But I use it primarily as a saucepan, cooking rice and all sorts of other various stuff in there. That was a, a cheap one off. Amazon I believe that my mother bought me a long time ago but it's lasted the test of time it's been pretty bulletproof to be honest with you and hopefully it'll be something I keep for a long time so cheers mum appreciate that I put my hat down somewhere earlier and I can't for the life of me find it. And I just don't know where I put it. I want to talk about a couple of things really. I always use live hazel when I'm making a spit roast. With a bigger bird, say a chicken or a pheasant, what I do, that horizontal spit, before I put the pigeon on, uh, before I put the bird on, I drive my knife directly through through the spit itself and then cut a little piece of wood about that long that will keep that split open and then shave it off so it's flush with the with the spit 
what it happens then is when you when you slide the bird onto the spit or you push the spit through the bird itself you can make another stake and drive it down through the bird through the spit and out the other side of the bird and to prevent the bird from spinning while you're turning the spit it's a really good tip um, something I've been doing for a long time but with a pigeon of that size what normally happens is that it'll grip the spit when, it, when the, the first flash heat gets to it it'll grip the spit and it won't turn it anyway but with a bigger heavier bird I'd always recommend making that split in the spit and staking it so so that the bird doesn't turn the reason that we use hazel which is live is that it's not susceptible to burn I've seen people do it use dead stick you wouldn't believe how many times and uh, come halfway through cooking it ignites and the spit breaks in half it's quite a funny situation to be in I don't normally swear in the uh, in my videos but back here now he was low um whew. that was a bit of fun wasn't it well that totally blew a uh, whatever I had to say out the, out, out the window because uh so what we can see here growing on this dead branch is called a fire cake these are known as King Alfred's cakes but I don't like using the term I just like to call them fire cakes and what they are is a type of fungus that grows on dead ash primarily but what he's been used for for I guess in millennia is um if we break it open inside you can see it's made up of a fi fibrous um, yeah it's quite fibrous inside and when these are super dry which I can tell this one isn't when it's super dry you can get a fire a ferrocerium rod or a fire steel and strike a uh, strike a spark straight into this and it'll, it'll catch an ember and it'll ember for a long time you can actually carry um, you could carry your fire f to make another fire in another area at a later date it's absolutely brilliant things so they burn for a long long time and they don't they don't really go out at all so if you if you find these and they're not dry just go and pop them by the fire and let them dry out by the fire and then you can save them then for a later date they're really really good bushcraft material right there just let them sit by the fire and dry out just force dry them basically what I would recommend is that you go and have a walk when times are not busy around the fire and collect a few of them and do it as part of your, your daily activities it's something fun to do and something that's super useful then and there's a real satisfaction of going like in a fire in another area with a tinder that you've harvested at an earlier date from the woods so that bird's been on there for quite a while now so we're gonna just sterilise, I always say this just sterilise the, um, the spit as well because obviously you drove that through the raw meat it, it should happen anyway over the fire but just give it a good flash kick off the fire and um yeah you won't have anything to worry about i mean you're just because you're going to drag that bird back over the spit that you put through raw so yeah you know what i mean get a bird well, might as well hand it off now put the spit on the fire get some of your catkins and uh put it on the rice like I said, the minerals, vitamins and protein in those catkins are absolutely great. So, well, there's only one thing left to do now, guys, and that is tuck in. So I'm going to go back over to my seat. You can join me if you want. So, first thing to do is try some of the nettles, rice and catkins. Mm, beautiful. They're uh, 
the nettles really go well with the rice I find it gives a little bit more of a complexity to the what could be quite bland rice again the, the minerals and the vitamins and the protein inside the pollen and the catkins are going to provide you with good energy prevent you from getting ill such as colds and stuff because they've got a lot of uh, anti-inflammatories as well in them which is another thing let's try some of this wood pigeon obviously I sterilized my knife with boiling water but also I wrote hand, uh, hand sanitizer I always keep hand sanitizer with me I think it's a great little commodity to your, to your bushcraft bag is uh, more than challenging cutting this while he's talking to you but here we are like I said about being well cut here's a perfect piece of wood pigeon breast oh man People say, you know, car, you go out roughing it. Am I roughing it really? Is that roughing it? It's a damn nice meal. Right, I'm gonna get stuck into this, and um, yeah, the light's dropping fast, so soon it's gonna be dark. I'm gonna prep some more firewood just to keep that fire going throughout the night. Like I said, it's not very warm at all, probably. It warmed up a bit, it went up to about 40 degrees, but come back down now to about 3 again, so. See you in a bit, I guess.